I think if it's possible, what we're looking at here is a good show that is not a good musical. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional theatre critic living here in the UK, and this is my theatre-themed YouTube channel, where I review the shows that I have been invited to go and see in the West End and beyond. And on Sunday, I was invited to a very special Father's Day gala performance of Mrs. Doubtfire the Musical. This show has changed its name a few times, so let me check. Mrs. Doubtfire the New Comedy Musical. At one point it was just Doubtfire, but it's it's back to being Mrs. Doubtfire the New Comedy Musical. Currently playing at the Shaftesbury Theatre in the West End. So like I said, I saw a gala performance of this a few days ahead of its official opening night. But now that you're seeing this video, the embargo on reviews has been lifted, so I can finally share my thoughts with you all. So this musical has been affected by a little bit of controversy since the beginning. It came on the heels of various other shows, some of which were criticised for their erasure of trans characters, like the musical Jagged Little Pill, and others of which were criticised for positioning a man in a dress to be a source of comedy. I'm talking about the musical Tootsie. Mrs. Doubtfire came on the back of those and came under fire for similar comedic opportunities. But that wasn't even the show's biggest problem because its original Broadway run was hugely interrupted and affected by COVID-related shutdowns. Coupled with a few other factors, this is why the Broadway run was ultimately unsuccessful and the show closed very early on. But it is now trying its luck in the West End where adaptations of films as musicals generally have proved a little bit more popular in recent years. Looking at you, Pretty Woman. And with Pretty Woman closing in the West End after a reasonably successful run at the Savoy Theatre in the same month that Doubtfire is set to open, is this the next popular show for tourists hoping to come to London to see a musical adaptation of one of their favourite films? So we have a lot of questions to answer in today's review. First of all, of course, is the show actually any good? Second of all, how does it handle its potentially transphobic implications and themes? Because society has progressed and moved on since the time when this film was originally made, right? And thirdly, who exactly is this show for? I'm going to attempt to answer all of those questions in today's review video, so stay tuned for all of that discussion. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming very soon, as well as lots of other theatre-themed content. And if you would like to see my videos before everybody else does, as well as gain access to some exclusive theatre-themed content, you can click on the link and become one of my channel members for just £2.99 a month. And maybe if enough people do, I will buy sun cream. Yes! I am sunburned, it happened, we've all seen it, let's move on. So let's talk about Mrs. Doubtfire the Musical right after this sneak peek of the show's gala performance curtain call. <laughs> So let's talk briefly about the plot. For anyone who has not seen the film and does not know the story of Mrs. Doubtfire, this is about a character named Daniel Hillard, uh, whose wife asks for a divorce because he's not particularly mature, uh, he's not really an effective co-parent, He's more of a selfish adolescent force that she wants out of her life. Suddenly without a job and without a home, Daniel is denied joint custody and is only allowed to see his children once a week. His three children that he shares with his now ex-wife Miranda. So when she decides that she's going to hire a nanny rather than allow him to look after the kids, he comes up with a plan that will help him to see his children more regularly. And he disguises himself as Mrs. Doubtfire. And without telling you anything else about the plot, comedy ensues. So what we have here is this character who has worked as a voiceover artist, who has made his career on impressions, deciding to impersonate an older British nanny in order to be able to see his children. So because of the problematic nature of the few shows that preceded this one's run on Broadway, because it is a comedy about a man dressing up as a woman, and because it's about a man dressing up as a woman and disguising himself in order to gain access to children under false pretenses, there is a concern that this show 
show may evoke a transphobic feel, but is the show's material itself willfully transphobic? So there is so much to say about this. Honestly, it's probably its own video, but for reasons that will become clear by the end of this section, I don't want to give it too much mileage. I've discussed this at length with some friends whose opinion on this is much more important than mine is as a cisgender man. I've also read some brilliant think pieces, and from what I can tell, this is my first time seeing the show, but I do think that the show has evolved slightly, based on what I've read from some earlier accounts of it. Because as far as I could tell, and as far as queer friends of mine could tell, there was nothing obviously transphobic in this show's material. There are certainly things in the film that have not aged well. There's a scene in which one of uh, his children sees him dressed as Miss Doubtfire, but using a toilet while standing up, and it implies certain things, and that has been altogether changed in the show, so it's just a child sort of seeing him with this latex mask half off of his face. There's nothing implied about genitalia and no jokes based around that. Honestly, most of the humor from the show doesn't come from this being a man dressed as a woman. They don't really play on gender as a source of comedy, and for that reason I don't think there's really much transphobic material or any transphobic material deliberately in the show. I think the only concerning thing about this show is its implications. How someone could take this idea of a man dressing as a woman to gain access to his children and how that could carry a transphobic implication. But I also think that there's a particular group of people, I'm talking about trans exclusionary radical feminists, who will seize any opportunity in order to weaponize it against the trans community, the very much marginalized trans community. But I don't think this show should be punished for the way that it could potentially be weaponized. Equally, and this is probably my hottest take on this, I don't think that the trans conversation will even enter into a discussion with this show in the UK. Many of you are probably watching this video and hadn't even connected this to a trans place and probably wonder why I'm talking about this so much, and are maybe even a little bit frustrated by that. I think it is important, but I think our relationship to drag in the UK is a little bit different because we have pantomimes. In almost every town in the UK at Christmas time, there will be a pantomime performed and there will be a man dressed as a pantomime dame, not necessarily necessarily playing up femininity, but it's not dissimilar to a Mrs. Doubtfire kind of a performance. And Mrs. Doubtfire in this show so doesn't read like a drag performance, it just reads like a disguise, because they don't play up the femininity of it all particularly. It's so transformative. We see every element of the transformation in painstaking detail, which for the most part is done with relatively little vulgarity. And so the headline of all of this for me is, I don't think a British audience will see a man in a dress and automatically connect it to a transphobic implication, or connect it to a conversation about the trans community. And I think by propagating that conversation, I'm bringing it into this narrative, or we as a theatre community are bringing the trans community into this narrative, and I think that's sort of just as bad, so I'd much rather leave them out of this conversation because I don't think that this is something a British audience is really going to consider. So that's what I have to say on that. I went to see this show with my good friend Ellie Talks Theatre, who will soon be publishing a video review of the show on her channel, so stay tuned for that one. Hers is a very important perspective in this conversation, uh, which has insights that I can't possibly have. There are just a couple of brief, brief moments in the show that give me a little bit of ick. When uh, Daniel first goes to his brother and asks to be turned into a woman, uh, they conjure up the images of various divas and various gay icons like Cher and Donna Summer, and then he explains that he wants something a little older, a little more robust, and they conjure up the image of Julia Child and Eleanor Roosevelt and Angela Merkel and Margaret Thatcher, and you have members of the male ensemble playing these women uh, in, in their outfits and looking a little bit frumpier and a little bit more matronly. Which, regardless of what you thought of all of these women, is evidently a little bit insulting, but I don't think it's transphobic. I think, if anything, it's a little bit misogynistic. And I think this show is problematic in other ways. There's a moment at the top of the second act where Miranda, who is designing active wear, uh, is missing a plus-size model 
support from her lineup, so recruits Mrs. Doubtfire to step in at the last minute. Mrs. Doubtfire does a sort of a hip hop dance and takes everyone by surprise, but she is among this lineup of super thin models in this activewear range that Miranda says is meant to be for all shapes and ages. And the problem here is that the ensemble of this show is not reflective of that ideal. Within the principal cast members, there are three black characters in this show. There is a humorless court official, there is a humorless TV producer, and there is the sassy gay husband of Daniel's brother. So on a diversity front, not great. I also don't like the way that Daniel is finally revealed to be Mrs. Doubtfire, but I'm going to talk about that more in the main bulk of the review. For now, I will circle back and say I do not think that this show is in and of itself transphobic, but I also don't think it's good. Let me tell you why. So I have seen the film, and like I imagine many of you do, I have very fond memories of the film, most of which centre around the brilliant central performance by Robin Williams. But even leaving him out of the conversation, this is a story that people will very readily fall in love with. Why? Because it's all about how much this father loves his kids and the lengths that he is willing to go to in order to be able to see them and spend more time with them. There are certain things he has to learn about that, and for much of the show he's still doing it with an element of selfishness and he needs to come to terms with a lot of truths about that but ultimately it's a story about how much kids mean to their parents and the way that it all ends and ties together it's always going to make you feel an incredible fondness it's very heartwarming and this show executes all of the emotional beats of that story very, very well. And it ends very well. It will leave you feeling very emotionally fulfilled. I actually think it's a good show. I really think it's a good show that you will enjoy and that will put a smile on your face. And so many people are going to come and see this and think, yes, this is a really good show. And I agree but I don't think it's a good musical. What do I mean by that, you might ask? Well, like so many things we've seen recently, I think this belongs to that third genre of show. You have musicals, you have plays, and then you have staged films. I'm talking about Dirty Dancing, I'm talking about My Neighbor Totoro, I'm talking about Pretty Woman, I'm talking about Back to the Future. Now, two of those use music exclusively from the film, and two of them add new songs for the stage, much like Doubtfire does. And the ones that add new songs I enjoy those shows. I like Pretty Woman. I like Back to the Future. But I don't think the songs add anything particularly special. And I think they only exist so that producers can call it the musical and more people will buy tickets. Because people wouldn't come to just see Pretty Woman on stage. They would just watch the DVD. But call it the musical and it feels different enough that they will book train fare and pay for a hotel. I think the same thing is happening here with Mrs. Doubtfire. The best parts of this show are the book scenes. And you have some very long scenes that happen without songs entirely. Because you don't need songs in order to tell this story. At no point in this show do I think, ah, that was really elegant by adding a song. That never once happens. This is at times a slapstick comedy, a comedy about mistaken identity with tremendous heart. It doesn't need songs in order to tell this story. I don't think so. And the songs themselves, unfortunately, I think are incredibly generic. If you haven't had a chance to listen to this cast recording yet, go have a listen. Maybe you'll disagree with me. Maybe you'll find that they're really fun and really engaging. There are a couple of moments I enjoy in this score, but much like the score for Back to the Future, don't hate me, Back to the Future fans, I can enjoy listening to these songs in the moment, but they don't leave any kind of a lingering impression. It's taken me many listens of those songs to really find them to have any kind of lasting impact. And almost the entirety of the Doubtfire score has already fallen squarely out of my head. I do not remember any of those songs. And seconds after they were finished in the theatre, I couldn't have told you what they sounded like. They are inconsequential. Not only is the writing of these songs particularly generic, the lyrics are lacklustre, but the moments that they have chosen to musicalise in this show, in this story, baffle me entirely. It harkens back to a time years before we really knew how to use musicals as an art form and how to use songs to push a story forwards and to allow characters to sort of sit in a moment and sing their feelings. There are maybe one or two moments in this story that I think are musicalized well. One of them is when Miranda Hillard sings to her confidant, Mrs. Doubtfire, who she doesn't realize is her ex-husband in disguise, about the shortcomings in their marriage and about her frustrations. And he unbeknownst to her, is sat there listening to all of this, feeling increasingly guilty. It's a big turning point in his arc. That's a solid moment with a song that could be a little bit better, but it is heavily outweighed by a bunch of moments that just don't need to be songs. And as many moments that could be songs, 
but are just missed opportunities. Going back to Pretty Woman as an example, one thing I've always said is that the big mistake, huge moment that is just repeated verbatim from the film doesn't land or have any kind of an impact in the theater because it comes in the middle of a song and she pauses the song to just say this line, just to speak it, and then goes back into singing. Now you're in a musical version of the film. You have more tools at your disposal. Why is this line not sung as part of a song? We want to hear the musical version of Vivian Ward belting, big mistake, huge. And I think, in the same vein, we want to hear the musical version of Miranda Hillard singing a song around the idea of those iconic lines at the end, the whole time, the whole time, the whole time, I have to go, I have to go. But instead, she just does a pretty good Sally Field impression. The problem is, no one's going to be able to do Sally Field as well as Sally Field. And we have YouTube now. We can go and listen to that clip. And if you like that clip, like me, you've heard it time after time after time. You know exactly what Sally Field looks and sounds like. So any inconsistency, of which there are going to be some because she's not a robot, is going to be highlighted in your brain. And she's never going to be able to do the perfect Sally Field impression. Nor do I think she should, because that's not particularly satisfying for an actor or an audience member. Equally, Gabriel Vick should not be out here trying to do a Robin Williams impression because who on earth can do Robin Williams? The most successful adaptations of Robin Williams material have been where they've moved in a completely different direction. Like with all of the Aladdin stuff post Robin Williams, the casting has been completely different with Will Smith in the live action remake, with James Monroe Eigelhart and everyone who has come after him in the stage version. The best parts of Gabriel Vick's performance are where he is allowed to bring his own individuality to this role and not try and do a recreation of Robin Williams. And I don't think he does a Robin Williams impression when he is just playing Daniel. When he's playing Mrs. Doubtfire, obviously he has to do the iconic voice. And I don't have too much of an issue with that because it feels as though he's still allowed to bring his own sense of humor to the whole thing while paying a beautiful homage to Robin Williams. You're never going to be able to remove Robin from this story, nor do I think we should because he is the reason so many people fell in love with it in the first place. But you have to allow this material and these performers to take a few steps away from that original version. To that end, my favorite parts of this show are things that do not happen in the film. There's a whole nightmarish musical dream sequence in which he sees an entire line of dancing Mrs. Doubtfires, and I think that's a fun and zany musical theater kind of a moment. We could do with more of that. I really love the choreography. It's unexpectedly high energy, but it's something we didn't get in the film. I wasn't expecting the dance to be nearly as full out in this show as it actually is, but those dancers are working on that stage. My goodness, that was really thrilling to me because I didn't see it coming. But when they recreate comedy moments from the film, I saw them coming because I've seen the film and, and everyone else will as well. And I know there is an expectation. People who are coming to see this show need to have certain boxes ticked, but a musical can tick those boxes in slightly different ways. You don't have to just deliver the exactness of the film on stage. I think that's what I'm saying here. So I'm going to try and talk through some of the things that I did enjoy about this show. I think the way that they manage the transformation into Mrs. Doubtfire on stage is remarkable. And the pace that they can do it at, he is changing backwards and forwards so much in this show. And I think they have different levels to which they do the transformation depending on different scenes. We see an awful lot of it, which on occasion is impressive. And I think it's good that we see it and it demystifies it a little bit. But then there is a scene at the end in the restaurant where there's this screen that turns transparent so we can see the transformation happening behind. I don't know if that overplays the hand slightly and spoils a little bit of the quick change magic uh, when he is sort of almost instantly changing between the two. He also has this suit that he wears when he's just being Daniel out of the Doubtfire costume that zips up like a onesie. I wish they hadn't shown us how that worked because it would have been mind blowing when he just comes out in a suit and we're like, wait, there wasn't possibly time for that. I don't think they need to show us that bit specifically. But I do give them credit for achieving this transformation because this is something that shows like Priscilla Queen of the Desert and everybody's talking about Jamie, have historically struggled with. And it's because those shows to do a full glamour drag transformation would need to do like precision eye makeup and they get away with using very clever prosthetics but the people who have designed this costuming and these prosthetics and these wigs have done a tremendous job the likes of which I don't think we have ever seen on stage before, not pulled off this swiftly. In fact, the entire design team of this show, the set design is stunning and lush. I love when something is really thoroughly produced and this production looks like a tremendous amount of money. I like the costuming. I like the designs of different sets. There is a little bit of sparseness when the house goes away and we just have this 
backdrop with this kind of like bright blue underneath with the San Francisco skyline. But I enjoy the set of his apartment and the TV studio and the house so much that I can get over that. Let me shout out some of the specific creatives whose work I am praising here. The scenic design, of course, the wonderful David Corrins, an incredible, a master of set design. Catherine Zuber, costume design, also incredible, a brilliant, brilliant artist. Philip S. Rosenberg's lighting design, Brian Ronan's sound design. The hair design, David Brian Brown, an exceptional job. Another thing I do enjoy about this show, it takes tremendous care when depicting these children who are experiencing divorce. I think, like I said, that's the real heart of the show and it extends an extraordinary gentleness and carefulness in the way that it allows them to navigate all of this. I think the way that those young characters are written is fantastic. Another iconic thing you will think of when you think of Mrs. Doubtfire is the scene with the hoovering and Aerosmith's Dude Looks Like a Lady. Now they couldn't license or they chose not to license Aerosmith's song for a musical using an original score, so instead they have written a song called I'm Rockin' Now. And I do give the songwriting team here credit for writing a song that kind of like pokes at the Aerosmith song from the film. The opening number itself, it does well at introducing us to Daniel as a character. What they do with the pre-show announcement blending into the show and giving us a flavor of him doing different impressions, I think is solid. They obviously have adapted this to include various different UK pop culture references. So he does like a Boris Johnson impression and he does a Charles III impression and he does uh, some Lord of the Rings. I don't know how much of the Lord of the Rings was in on Broadway. I feel like that could honestly just be an either or. I don't think we need a British political joke and a British royal joke as well, but you know, the audience responded to it, so I can't say anything. All of this being said, there are also many other issues that I have with the show. I'm going to tell you a few more of them now. The second act opens with a few scenes that take place in Stuart Dunmire's gym. Stuart is Miranda's business associate who becomes her romantic interest. And he is a handsome and charming man that Daniel is clearly envious of. So Daniel, as Mrs. Doubtfire, tries to dissuade Stuart from going after his ex-wife, uh, which I think we could have a lot more fun with that interaction than we actually have. And again, the best material there is all in the dialogue and in the scene when they get into this song, it's just a little bit pointless. It's a whole kind of like an anything you can do, I can do better kind of a thing, but the lyrics don't have much wit. It's just a forgettable kind of a song. And we spend so long in this gym that I start to question why we're here, why they've located so much of this in a gym space, it's, it's just a little odd to me. I get going there for the fashion show, but if this interaction were to be happening subsequently back at the house, then it would frame it better in the context of it being about the family, because that's what the whole thing is about, rather than it being about Stuart lifting weights and looking handsome and muscly. I get what they're trying to show us with that, but it portrays him as a vain character. And I think the production and the narrative ought to be more supportive of him as a good guy against which Daniel can more clearly be seen as not the best guy, even though he is our protagonist. It's, it's, it's a difficult path to walk, I get that. Because Stuart can very easily start to feel like the interloper and the villain. It depends on whether or not you're rooting for Daniel and Miranda to get back together, which by the end of the show, you ought not to be. Arguably, if you've been paying attention from the beginning of the show, you probably ought not to be, but people will have different perspectives on this. So this is a little bit of a spoiler, but Daniel obviously can't keep up this lie forever, and they are in in like a flamenco restaurant when he is going backwards and forwards between a meeting with a prospective new TV employer where he has to be himself, a man, and a birthday dinner for his ex-wife and her new boyfriend and the kids where he has to be Mrs. Doubtfire. So he's changing backwards and forwards and he gets caught in this flamenco dance. The flamenco dancer is singing a song about a lover who lied to her. It's all very on the nose. And he gets spun around uh, and like the wig comes off and then the dress comes off and it's all a little bit much because he's left standing there in like a new delusion bodysuit with underwear on and his head out. It's a little bit tasteless the way that that's done, but it's also staged incredibly clumsily. This is the principal problem that I have with it, is it isn't directed very cleanly and it seems very contrived that he would get stuck there and all of the clothes would individually be ripped off. It's not like you can see it coming and we'll start to laugh in suspense and be like, oh God, no, I see where this is going. It just kind of happens awkwardly before our eyes and we are 
persuaded to believe it, but not very convincingly. I spoke earlier about moments I think should be musicalized. I don't know why there is not a help is on the way song. The line help is on the way dear is said during this gym scene right after she says, I'm one of my models dropped out, please will you help? Mrs. Doubtfire then says the help is on the way line. It's a different context to the film. And it's really just to tick it off because the audience won't leave the theater until they have heard that line. I don't know why there isn't a help is on the way song in the first act when Mrs. Doubtfire is beginning to turn things around at the house and her presence is having such a positive effect. I think if they'd written a song there called help is on the way, that would be a little bit more substantial. What we have instead is a song in the first act where Mrs. Doubtfire is learning to cook with the help of the internet. And there are like Siri is a person played by one of the ensemble who pops out of the kitchen island and then different people like come out of the, the kitchen cabinet and then a whole the, the fantasy of dancing chefs appear and try and throw butter and stuff around the stage. And it's a fun musicalized fantasy number. I just don't know why it's happening. It's another completely puzzling musical number to me. When there are things to be doing in this plot, I don't know why we waste so much time with fantasy tap dancing chefs. When I think of moments like that, it's almost as if this entire musical has been uh, auto-generated by AI. It's taken an existing screenplay and added in the most cliched and random and tonally disparate musical numbers like, oh, we'll do a I'm better than you song here, and we'll do a fantasy tap dancing chorus line of characters who aren't really their song here. They don't make sense with each other, nor do they make sense for this show. It means the show doesn't have a consistent musical voice, and we just have musical numbers popping up for the sake of it, so that we can call the thing a musical, so we can charge slightly more for tickets than if it wasn't a musical. There is one more thing I need to say about this that has just suddenly popped into my head, but there is one lyric in this show I think it rhymes with granny. It's like a rap bit uh, that Mrs. Doubtfire does. And she describes herself as having an extra wide fanny. Now, I know this is an American character, but I'm here to tell you this is a British audience. And that means something different here than what it means over there, because that means bottom in America. And it means a different female body part over here uh, that should not be described as extra wide on a grandmother. That's not a conversation we want to begin to start having. That's not great. So my highest praise for this show starts and ends with Gabriel Vick. He is stepping into the enormous shoes of the late great Robin Williams and he is playing Daniel Hillard, AKA Mrs. Doubtfire. He is an incredible impressionist. He is charming. He is funny. He is another one of those. I've talked about a few of them recently. He's an obnoxious and self-involved and self-centered character, but we still root for him from the off because he has this charm and he has this quality that's ultimately endearing. But because we're kind of with him from the start, by the time that he betters himself and goes on this moral journey by the end of the show and comes to understand his ex-wife and his kids and puts their needs before his own, then our hearts just like grow three sizes. It's a wonderful moment, all because we connect so much with him as a character. But he's just fantastic. Like I told you, the impressions are on point. He does the whole thing tirelessly and it's a ridiculous track that he has to do in this show. The transformations and the changes in characterization, it's very easy to forget that this is one man on stage portraying both of these characters. He has a moment on stage where he has to do this educational rap with loop pedals that he is controlling himself on stage. Like, it, it's ridiculous. The things he has to do with props and the technical elements of all of this. It's a performance of vast technicality that you can't help but marvel at. The three children are also played so, so endearingly, led by Carla Dixon Hernandez, who plays the oldest of the three, and she is a wonderful presence. She has a lovely voice. She gets to belt out some angsty teenage songs, and she perfectly pitches young enough to be believable, but clearly mature beyond her years. It's difficult to get that right without her just feeling old, but she's been very well cast to strike an excellent balance there. We have to talk about Laura Tebbett, who plays Miranda. I've seen Laura before in School of Rock, where she played not a dissimilar role, actually, uh, but she is vocally an absolute superstar. She gets to show off her astonishing voice in the second act when she's singing uh, Miranda's sort of confessional song. And I think the writing of a lot of her character makes it difficult for us to support her throughout, even though she's obviously the parent who is making 
the better choices and making the more responsible choices. I wish the narrative were a little bit kinder to her, but I think she performs everything she needs to very, very well. Samuel Edwards plays Stuart Dunmire, and he's kind of just a charming cliche, but again, he executes his material well. Two of my absolute favourites in this cast, Cameron Blakely and Marcus Collins as Daniel's brother Frank Hillard and his husband. They are hilarious, the characterizations are so clear, they are a pair of gay cliches, but they aren't depicted in a mean-spirited way. Cameron Blakely's character, I, th I think he's terrific in the first few lines we get to meet him, and then he's kind of just reduced to this one joke where we're told every time he lies, he shouts, and so he just keeps shouting progressively louder throughout the show, and that's really the one joke that his character has. He gets one moment of sort of angsty indifference in the second act when he throws his hands in the air and he says he can't keep supporting what his brother is doing, but because we've just known him as a joke this entire time, it doesn't really ring true. There's also a moment right towards the end when Daniel is discovered and Cameron Blakely says to him, you'll be fine, and he yells it because the joke is he doesn't really believe that because the situation looks so bleak. But the problem is it's kind of like half shouted and it's not really clear and it doesn't land. What needs to happen there is he needs to say, Daniel and put his hand on his shoulder or something like that to establish a normal register and then yell, you'll be fine, so we can hear the difference, then we'll laugh at the joke. Marcus Collins, however, is a revelation. Marcus Collins is exceptional in this show, to the point that I just want more Marcus Collins all the time. He is over the top, flamboyant, screaming about Donna Summer, perfectly characterized. He is the best part of these comedic scenes that he walks into and finds himself trapped amongst a whole load of mistaken identity awkwardness. Those scenes are hilarious because of his reactions to them and the way that he reacts to his husband, Cameron Blakely's character, yelling. Absolutely fantastic. A plus stuff for me. So I told you back at the beginning of this video, I was going to address who this show would be for. And like I've said, I don't think this is a good musical. I think I've made that point quite clear. And musical theater, I think is such an exceptional art form. It can do so, so much. This story could be turned into a great musical by the right composers and by perhaps braver and more intrepid creatives and adapters. I question at the same time whether musical theater is even the right choice for adapting this story, but I also think none of this matters. Like I've said recently with other shows, like We Will Rock You, and like with Pretty Woman, the people who are wanting to go and see this show, I think they're gonna be tremendously satisfied with this because it's still crowd-pleasing, it's still entertaining, the performances are great, the jokes are there, this, it looks expensive, it has these quick changes in these costumes and it takes off all the moments from the film. It falls so much short of what a musical version of this might achieve and what the best stage adaptation of Mrs. Doubtfire as a movie could achieve, but I think Honestly, people are still going to be pretty satisfied by this. So if you love, love, love this film and you just like going to musicals, but it's not your entire life, probably you'll really enjoy this. If you loved Back to the Future, it doesn't matter to you that the score is not the most incredible, most ingenious thing ever written, then you'll probably enjoy this. If you feel similarly about Pretty Woman and you don't care that the songs are not the highlight part of that show, that it's more about those characters and their chemistry and the romance of it all and the songs just get us from point A to point B without being scene stealing moments in and of themselves, then again, you might enjoy Mrs. Doubtfire. I think this is a show that you can take kids to. I mean, aside from the extra wide fanny moment, that's that's still a dubious one. Also, the kids on stage swear a couple of times. It's up to you as a parent how you feel about that and the age of your children. But I think it's a great show for the whole family and there aren't that many that I would comparably say are as great for whole family entertainment. Those have been my thoughts on the Mrs. Doubtfire musical currently playing in the West End. I think that this will get a big response. I think there's enough love for this film and I think enough people will go to this and enjoy it and recommend it to their friends, their family members, their colleagues that this is probably gonna have a decent run in the West End. By the time that I'm posting this, the other reviews will have come out. I don't expect they'll be particularly kind, but I also don't think it's gonna make a huge difference to the longevity of the show's West End life. And I think it will do at least a year in the Shaftesbury. I would be surprised if it doesn't do two, but we will see. 
In the meantime, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope that you have enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews of all the upcoming West End shows. Also, if you want to see early and exclusive videos here on my channel, or if you just want to help support me in making more content, click on the link in the description and sign up to become one of my channel members. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>